Okay, so this is a revision, and we will go through as much as possible of 17, 18, 19, and we will see what is the core of the chapter, what's more important than what, and special senses. Of course, we need to remember the, the yes. It, it, I, I rec um, I, I'm recording this and I, I will post it, uh, I will upload it on the, uh, on the YouTube so you will have an access to it. Um, special senses, of course I want you to know what are the special senses and I can, I can give you something from the general senses and I ask you which one of the, of, the, of the following is not a special sense for example. Like olfactory, gestation, vision, uh, pain, for example, which one of those is not a special sense? Or the other way around. I can give you something like vibration, pain, touch, uh, vision. Which one of those is a special sense? So you need to remember the five special senses. Uh, the olfactory reception is detecting the dissolved chemical. So this is the mechanism of these recept receptors. How does it work? It's through chemicals that's dissolved and it will go interact with protein. That's called the odorant binding. Uh, uh, anything that I skip, it means it's less important. I'm, I'm not saying that there is something that's not, that that's you're not supposed to know at all, but this is your the core of the chapter again. This is what I'm focusing on more. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is time management. Time management. You're not going to treat everything the same and distribute your time all over and then you end up not doing good because you didn't know what's the core of the chapter, right? So as you go, you can just read something and you can focus on something. This is what I'm focusing on right now. How the olfactory um, uh, accents or the, how the olfactory fibers go through the, 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 uh, go through the skull or go from the uh, penetrate the, the skull bone and go to the brain. It's through the cripiform plate of ethmoid until they go to olfactory bulb, olfactory tract. And what do you call those together? Olfactory bulb and olfactory tract? Olfactory, olfactory nerve which is nerve, cranial nerve number? One. One. Okay, um, the, the, uh, if you go to the olfactory pathway, after the olfactory tract, the fibers will go uh, all the way to the uh, hypothalamus part of it, will go to the limbic system, and, uh, and finally it will go to the uh, olfactory cortex. Most of the time, most of the time, the uh, sensations go to the thalamus first, okay, to filter it out, to tell you this is important, to sort it out, this is important, this is less important, and so on. So the thalamus is like the secretary of the brain. It will tell uh, any sensation coming, uh, are you an important sensation? Uh, not, not much? Okay, I block you. I will not give you an access to the cortex. The cortex is your awareness. So you don't have to be aware of everything. If it is something important, you will be aware of it. If not, it can be blocked. Example, the nagging pain of your knee. If you're having an, a knee problem and you have that every day, the whole day long, should you be aware of it every day, every second? Prob probably not. So these types of pain will be filtered out at the level of the thalamus and the thalamus will say, okay, I get that all the time. It's constant, it's happening all the time. It's low, low t intensity pain, so I'm going to block it. I don't have to tell uh, the, 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 the cortex about it and so on. But so anytime we, 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 we will need to know, does it synapse at the, at the thalamus or not? This is the point. So um, it will go without first synapsing to the thalamus.
there is a, a fast turnover of the olfactory receptors and it of course will decline with age and the rule of the thumb is everything decline with age you just take it like this taste the receptors are in the taste buds and the taste buds are in, um, in the lingual pap uh, papillae where is it it's in the dorsal surface of the tongue and these are the different types um, fungiform filiform and circumvallate these are the three different types so filiform fungiform and circumvallate and circumvallate in this part we need to know wh 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 which buds are, are um, located. So the filiform, for example, it does not have any. There's no test buds. Fungiform, just a little bit, like five. The vast majority where? Circumvallate. This is what actually contain 100 or, or, or close to that and the circumvallate papillae. In the buds itself, there are some stem cells and some gestatory. Um, the lifespan is about 10 days. Taste sensation will go to the thalamus. If, we, if, we're, if I'm asking if does it go to the thalamus or not, it does go to the thalamus. Cranial nerve will carry it. And it will go to the solitary nucleus. This is where the synapse occur. So it will go to the solitary nucleus of the medulla oblongata, and then the, to the thalamus, and then to the primary sensory cortex, which is the final destination of all of them. So it does synapse in the thalamus. Uh, you need to know what, what's the primary taste sensation, sweet, salt, sour, and better. And what's umami? This is a taste of, important to know, beef, chicken broth, and Parmesan cheese. This is not something that's salty, it's not something that's sweet, okay? It's something special. It's not bitter, it's not sweet, it's not salt, it's umami. Like what? Like nothing, it's umami, okay? So this is something special for these types of sensations. And where do we take the water? In the pharynx, not in the tongue. In the pharynx, this is how we detect water. So just like everything else, the chemicals are dissolved and it will get in contact with the receptors and this is how we get our sensation. Uh, gastocene, this is a G protein that responds to sweet, bitter, umami. Okay, so what's the gast gastocene? This is a G protein, it's a messenger that's used to respond to these taste sensations. PTC, this is something that a lot of Caucasians don't have it. 30% don't have it and 70% have it. It's a chemical that, that can be used to taste um, if you can or cannot. And this is related to other um, other problems, but this is what we need to know for the taste. Can you taste it or not? Okay. What's the lacrimal caruncle? Of course, it's this. This is all more important in the anatomy, and remember that we focus more in the lecture exams on the physiology. And we focus in the lab more on the anatomy. Okay, this is just the rule. Physiology, 90 something or 90%, it's physiology in the lecture. So it's more of function. In the, in the lab, we focus more on anatomy. So it's the other way around. 90% anatomy and 10% physiology. In the lecture, it's 90% physiology and 10% anatomy, something like this. So, but the lacrimal caruncle is this these two red spots right here, and this is when you can see these great deposits. Sometimes when you wake up in the morning, or most of the time, you see some deposits in here. This is on the cruncle. Um, conjunctiva, 
this is outside of the sclera and there are palpebral con uh, ocular and um, there is a pouch in between those two and every time you see a condition it's important okay and you'll see that in the concept at the, uh, the last slide I added the slide I will show you at the end and I will upload it too but um, anytime you see any abnormality or any concept like this it's important so what's conjunctivitis inflammation of conjunctiva and it will become red or pink so this is known as pink eye so the lacrimal apparatus where uh, the, the sequence is, is important here the sequence where do we start lacrimal gland lacrimal ducts bathing the eye and then go to the superior and inferior canaliculi uh, puncti I mean to the puncti first lacrimal puncti which are these tiny openings from which it will go to the canaliculi to the nasal uh, to the nasal uh, to, to the lacrimal sac lacrimal sac I'm sorry so from the canaliculi to the lacrimal sac to the nasal lacrimal duct and then it will end at the middle meatus or inferior canch uh, middle can uh, canca or cancha or uh, and the inferior meatus one of those right so the fornix is this pouch that we talked about one of the functions of of the uh, of the tear besides bathing and lubricating it does contain lysozymes so the function is antibacterial this is one of the functions of the lacrimal gland so we start from the pancti, canaliculi, sac, nasolacrimal sac, inferior meatus of the nose. The inferior meatus of the nose. This is the final destination. This is where it will drop um, uh, uh, at the end. The orbital fat is there to protect the eye, so it acts as a cushion. And every time, just take it as a rule, any time you see fat around any organ, know it is there to keep it in place, to fix it in place, to protect it, okay? So anytime the organ move around, it will, uh, we will see a cushion surrounded by a fat that it moves this way, the fat will absorb the shock, the other way around and so on. And this is where everywhere in the body. You will see that around the kidney, around the heart, all important organs will be surrounded outside, surrounded by fat from outside to absorb the shock, so anytime Anytime I see fat surrounding an organ, I ask you about the function, it's the same function. Cushion and insulator. Three layers, I can ask you what belong to what? Outer, metal, inner. What belong to the outer? Sclera, cornea. How about the metal? Choroid. Ciliary body, iris, ciliary process too, but the iris at the end. The, the inner one is the neural tunic and it's two layers, pigmented and neural part. So the, the important thing to remember here is what belong to what. The two cavities. The boundaries, you need to know that. Wh where is the anterior and which, where is the posterior? And what is the separation between those two? What's the separation? What marking the separation between the anterior cavity and posterior cavity? The lens. And what is the sub are the subdivisions of the anterior? The iris, yes, this is the boundaries. But what are the names, the two? Anterior and posterior chamber, yes. And what circulate within the whole in anterior cavity? Aqueous humor. humor. What's, what's with the filling of the posterior? Vitreous humor. Okay. And where do we, do we, do we secrete or make the, uh, the aqueous humor? Ciliary body. We make it at the ciliary body. It circulates around, keeping the shape of the cornea and part in this part of the eye. And where is it going to leave? Huh? Canal of Schlem. What if the Canal of Schlem is occluded? It is blocked for any reason. What do you get? 
What will increase first? Huh? What do you call it? Glaucoma. Glaucoma is a condition, yes. But but glaucoma is an increase of what? Pressure. Increase the pressure. It's it's called the increased intraocular pressure. Increase intraocular pressure in the anterior cavity. Why? One out of two things. It's not one. Either you increase production, okay, or you decrease the drainage. Decrease the drainage is usually canal of Schlem is closed for some reason. Increase production, hyperactive ciliary body for some reason. But in both cases, you're producing more than normal aqueous humor. It's going to accumulate. It's going to distend and stretch the cornea so it will appear like it will appear like blue kind of bluish discolored. And this is what glaucoma is all about. And again, anytime you see a concept, it's important. So glaucoma is obviously important. The limbus is the border between the cornea and sclera. Okay, you need to remember this. So we have sclera, we have cornea, yes, but in between it's called the limbus. What's the function of the vascular humor? Or the, uh, the uvea in general. Vascular humor is co also, called, also called the uvea. It's not also called choroid, not. Vascular tunic. Uvia is the same thing. It contains choroid plus ciliary body plus iris. Did you get the difference? So don't, uvia and choroid is not the same. So wh why do we have the uvia? What's the function? Of course, this is physiology, so you have to remember the function. What's the function? Number one, it's called vascular. So it supply the eye with blood vessels, with blood, blood supply. That's number one. Number two, it is dark. Okay, so it's isolating the eye so that the amount of light entering will enter only, will find one, will find one entrance only, which is the cornea and then the pupil, lens pupil, right? So this is the only entrance. Otherwise, everything else is dark. Why is it dark? Uvia. And part of, of, the, of the vascular tunic uh, which is the ciliary body, will secrete and the other part will reabsorb the aqueous humor. Which, which one secrete? Ciliary body. Which one absorb? Canal of Schlem. Both of them are vascular tunic, uvia. And it can sh uh, keep the shape of the lens as well. So we have the iris and the pupil is an opening in the iris. Uh, the pupil is controlled by two sets of muscles. Some of them are called restrictor that reduce the, the, uh, the, the diameter and the dilators will increase the diameter. And here's a question. What happened if I focused like a beam of light to the eye? Constrictors will work or the dilator will work? Constrictors. If, if, it, if it dilates, there is something abnormal in the nervous system. Okay, and this is one of the general examination. You can get a, a source of light and, and, and focus it into your eye and then move away, focus it more. If when I focus it, when it constricts and move away, it dilates, this is normal. If it's happening the other way around, there is something wrong with the nervous system. It should go like this. Okay, photoreceptors are important. You have to remember rods and cons. What does it do? Rods and cons. Which one is for day vision and color, and which one is for night vision? Rods are for night vision. Rods are for? Cons? Day color. Day color. The C goes with the C. Cons, color. C, C, cons, color. Okay, and it's important also to know that the cons, even though it is everywhere in the in the retina, but where is most clusters? Where is it, 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 is it concentrated more? In the fovea, and the fovea is at is inside at the center of the of the macula lutea. So remember that, right? The visual axis. You need to know where how it go through. It go from the object to the center of the cornea. Passing through the anterior chamber, passing through the, the pupil, then the lens, 
Then the vitreous humor, and what's the end point? What? Phobia. What if, if it converge and come anterior, in front of, not to the phobia, anterior to the phobia, and the vitreous, what do you call it? Near sight, what's the, what's the scientific name for near sight? Myopia. Myopia. And if it goes behind it, far sight, which is called? Myopia. Is myopia and hypermetropia important? Of course, yes. Any concept or anything that's not normal is very important. So this is the axis. And it should converge and go to the phobia centrales. Pathway. They go from the rods and cons, ganglion cells, so rods and cons, okay, and it will go through the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells and to, then to, to the optic nerve. Optic nerve, optic chasm, optic tract. So, do you know? Do you need to know the sequence of the of the of the stimulus? Yes. How do we start? Receptors, rods and cons, bipolar cells it has two pools, then to the ganglion cells, and the fibers will collect and make the optic nerve, optic chasm, optic tract, and we will see the rest. This is the axis again. Uh, and there are some horizontal cells in between those, which is horizontal cells and amacrine cells, which is the same as, just like horizontal cells. And what's the function of both of those? Why is it like horizontal intervening in between? The function is uh, to either facilitate or inhibit the communication between the photoreceptors and ganglion cells. Let's go back to this picture again. Why are we having these in the middle and we're having these in the middle? It's going transversely. Th this is the route, right? It goes like this. From the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells and then to the optic nerve. Why do we have this in the middle? Controlling the, um, the passage. What do you mean controlling? Facilitate or inhibition or inhibit depending on the situation. Optic disc. What do you, what's the other name for the optic disc? Blind spots. Does it have receptors? There are no receptors. This is just a collection of the fibers exiting out of the out of the eye. So it's called blind spots. Vitreous chamber. Uh, what color is the vitreous? The the the, the, the yeah. The consistency is jelly-like. But what color? Clear. clear. How about the aqueous humor? Clear. Lens. Clear. Everything has to be clear. Anything that's not clear means abnormality. Whatever the abnormality is. It should be clear completely. Everything. All the way from the object until you get to the fovea, everything in the visual axis should be clear. Colorless. Shouldn't have color. So intraocular pressure, that's with what we talked about. There should be intraocular pressure to keep the lens, I mean the, the, iris, uh, the cornea, and to keep the shape in general. It should be. But if that increased beyond normal, what do you call it? Glaucoma. You have the lens. Of course, it has to be transparent. The vitreous body. Why do we have? What's the vitreous body? Remember some of the of the um, of these models in the lab. There is one that's the the this bowl or um, uh, spherical shape structure inside that you can move it away, move it out, and leave the the pigmented part. This is called the vitreous body. Yes, I understand that the cover that you're seeing is the retina itself. Yes, but what's inside? It's full of. Do you remember? Did you take this ball out of the eye? Right? What's inside? What's the filling? Is it empty? There is, there is air inside? What's inside of this? Vitreous. So what do you call this body? 
vitreous body. Vitreous body. So it's called vitreous body. If I ask you, what is this outside? You say, yeah, this is the neural part of the retina. Yes. But what is this body? What do you call it? Vitreous body. The body that's full of vitreous. Cataract, of course, important. What's the cataract? The lens should be transparent. If you, if you lose the transparency, you get cataract. Any concept or abnormality is important. Senile cataract is the major part, or not, not the major, the vast majority of the cases, the most common cause is senile cataract. So you see those older people, they got cataract. Uh, did you have any problem? Did you have like an accident, anything? No, not, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. It's an aging process. And this is the most, most of the cases of the cataract will be senile cataract. Focal point is a point of intersection of the retina. Where should it be? Where's the location of the focal point? You see an object and it will go convex, 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 convex. And the focal point where everything will intersect. What is this point? Fovea. The focal point of fovea is fovea. Accommodation is where you change the curvature of the lens to accommodate the vision. Astigmatism, is it important? Yes, anything that's not normal is important. This is error of refraction. The, the, the curvature of the lens, of the cornea, okay, the refraction is not normal. It's, it, it, it is not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, like same concavity or, or, or it's not regular, it's irregular. So the refraction will not be normal and the vision will be distorted. There are special, special glasses that can fix this condition, but anyway, it goes like this. Okay, you have the cornea, it should be like this. It should be perfectly curved. If you have something in the curve, some, some irregularity, it will give you an error of refraction that's called astigmatism. Okay, so it's an error of refraction. They give you this distorted picture. Normal acuity should be 20 out of 20. If you have something uh, less than that, it's not, uh, it is uh, bad. Scotomas, this is abnormal blind spot. Do we have normal blind spot? Yeah. Yeah, which is optic death. Can you have abnormal? Yes, sometimes something happened to the vitreous humor a little bit of degeneration or something happened. So just a little small part, very tiny, of the vitreous humor change and acquire a color. And this will intervene. So this is where people will say, everything is perfect, but I see something like a fly or something black, like moving or fixed. This is Cotomus. Rhodopsin is what gives us the visual pigment, which is opsin and retinal. What's a retinal? Retinal is vitamin A. It comes from vitamin A. Visual pigments. And this is what actually absorbs the light. It consists of or derived from rhodopsin. Okay? So what's a rhodopsin? It's opsin plus retinal. What's a retinal? Vitamin A. What if you don't get do you don't get enough vitamin A? Night blindness. Is it important? Yes. Anything abnormal is important. Retinitis pigmentosa, pigmented inflammation of the retina. Can lead to, to blindness at the end. Most of the time it does. It's very progressive and very, very aggressive. What's bleaching? Bleaching is when the rhodopsin break down and become retinal and opsin. 
it, it will replenish, it will come together again, but this process is called bleaching. What's night blindness? It says deficiency of vitamin A. You can't see at night time. Color blindness, you're unable to detect certain colors. It can be one color, it can be more than one color, and so on. Okay, dark and light adaptation. When it is dark, do you dilate or constrict your pupil? Dilate. You're trying to get as much as possible of the light that's less than normal. It's dark. You don't have much light. So dilate your pupil as much as possible to, so that you can grab and get as much as possible of the light. And the opposite with the light. If it is light, you constrict your pupil. Okay? The pathway, I talked about this, for the receptors, rods and cons, to the bipolar, to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells have two types. M cells are those that monitor rods. P cells are those that monitor cons. This is the visual pathway, the whole thing. So you start from photoreceptors, rods and cons, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, optic nerve, they will cross. So this is called optic chiasm, and chiasm means crossing, and then optic tract. Okay, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation, and go to which part of the, of the cortex? Huh? Which is, which part? Occipital? Yes. So it ended at the occipital. Do you need to know this? Yes. I, I went through the pathway already. Again, photoreceptors, rods and cons, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, optic nerve, optic cast, optic tract, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation, occipital visual cortex. This is the end. And which nerve is helping us to do so? What's the name of the nerve? Optic, which, which is cranial nerve number? Okay, two. Circadian rhythm, this is day and night cycle. Okay, the eye will help with this. It's, it's, it's very complicated. There are parts of the brain that help, but when you see the light, that will give a signal to your brain that this is daytime. If it is dark, you start to feel like this is a nighttime. Uh, the ear, external, middle, and inner. The boundaries are important. What is between the external and middle? What separate those two? Tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane, which is also called eardrum. And then between the middle and inner ear. Oval window. And the oval window is a window. Don't forget this. It's a window. Means it's an opening. So this is the external ear. End with a tympanic membrane. Ceraminous gland. The name of the glands usually come from the type of secretion. If you secrete ceramin, I call you ceraminous. You secrete ceramin, I call you ceraminous. Ceramin is the air wax. Is it there for a reason? Yes, it protects anything or stop anything from entering and going to injure the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And it also have some, um, something in the, in the structure of the ceramin itself that will kill as much as possible of the pathogens. So this is why we have the ceraminous gland. Middle ear start from the tympanic cavity and end at the oval window, as, I, as we mentioned. And there are three auditory ossicles. 
and you have to know the arrangements, and I talked about this, luxury and leg. You have to know how it's arranged. You start from the external mirrors until you go to the eardrum. How about the inside of the middle cavity? You start from the inside of the eardrum and going to MIS, mess. Don't forget this. From outside to inside. The one that's attached to the tympanic membrane is malleus, followed by followed by stapes, and the stapes will end at oval window. Okay, so don't forget this. And this is where the name came from. Malleus means hammer, so it looks like a hammer. Means a hammer. Incus means looks like an anvil. Here is the anvil, how it looks like. And, this, and and when they looked at it, it actually looks like this. And this is where the name came from. Look at this. This is the stapes. Okay, which is looks like the stirrup, and the stirrup is what you put your foot on if you wanted to ride a horse or something. It looks exactly like it. So if you compare those, this to those, that looks like a hammer if you hold it from here. And this looks like an anvil, which is this. And this part right here looks like this. Arrangement is very important. Auditory tube, what's the other name for auditory tube? And what's the third name? Pharyngeal tympanic. Why do we have it? To e equilibrium of pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane. This is the function of the station tube. We have two muscles here, tensor and the name give it away. Tensor tympani. Tension of the tympanic membrane to make it tense. Why do you want to make it tense? To produce better sound. Stapedius muscle reduce reduce the movement of uh, stapes at the oval window. Inner ear, the outer part is bony and the inner part is membranous. Most important thing to remember here, what is the function of each part of those three? Okay, the vestibule contains saccule and utricle. Semicircular canals, what's the function? It looks like a circle. So what's the function? Rotation. It pick rotation. The vestibule, what's the function? Vestibule. How about the cochlea? Cochlea hearing. How about the vestibule? Gravity and linear acceleration. Yes, you have to know this. This is this is like the basics. You cannot forget this. Okay? very important slide. Gravity and linear acceleration, vestibule. <coughs> Rotation, semicircular canal. Sound or hearing, cochlea. Yes? The perilymph and, and the endolymph. The endolymph is the, the, uh, is the type of fluid that's inside the tubes. The perilymph is surrounding it from outside. So right under the bony labyrinth, this would be the perilymph. Inside the tubes, that would be the endolymph. And both of them, the composition uh, is very similar to the lymph, and this is where the name came from. Okay? What's the sta um, statuconia? Statuconia, these are calcium carbonates. Looks like the, the chalk, kind of like pieces, small pieces of chalk. It's calcium carbonate and it is on the surface of the gelatinous mass, and this is what will give you the equilibrium and position. So if you go like this, so these chalk-like pieces on the gel will go like this, so it will give you the, the position, statuconia. Statuconia and the gelatinous matrix, matrix together is called autolith. So I ask you what's the autolith? It's both of them together. Gelatinous material, see this? gelatinous material and the statuconia, okay? It's a statuconia on jelly-like material, gelatinous material. <coughs> so when you move around, it will move and bend the hair cells. And according to the bending, you can tell, are you bending anteriorly? Are you bending posteriorly? You can tell from the direction of, so here it is, this is, this is the gravity, and, and, and this is 
Statuconia, this is like the gelatinous material, and it, when it's moved like this, see how it's bending? If it's bending this way or bending the other way, you can tell. Are you tilting to the back or to the front? From the vestibule, we'll go to the vestibular uh, receptors, vestibular ganglia, vestibular branch, nuclei, And the function of the vestibular nuclei, this is important, it's function. What's, why do we have the vestibular nuclei? What are the vestibular nuclei first? These are nuclei in the brain. So vestibule will go all the way to the vestibular nuclei. The vestibular nuclei will um, coordinate with other structures, like coordinating with the, with the cerebellum. Why? Because the vestibule is responsible for equilibrium. The cerebellum is responsible for equilibrium. So since both of us are doing the same job, how about we communicate with each other? Okay, so to produce better equilibri equilibrium. You have your tools, I have my tools. Can we communicate? So this is one thing. Uh, cerebral cortex. You have to tell the cerebral cortex what is your position. So we can link all of these together. Okay, so you get the sense of balance of equilibrium from both sides, put them together, and relay that with the cerebellum, and then you send that to the cerebral cortex, and finally, you will send the information to the motor nuclei in the brainstem and spinal cord. Why? Because if you are not at equilibrium, what's your goal? Here's my goal. I'm vestibular nuclei. Uh, what's your function? I'm bringing sensation from the vestibule. What's the function of the vestibule? Equilibrium. So here's what I'm going to do. Vestibular nuclei. To do my job the optimal way. I'm trying to keep you at balance and equilibrium. What should I do? Number one, I'll get information from both sides. Number two, I will communicate with the cerebellum. Why? Because the cerebellum is doing the same job. So how about to communicate together? Number three, I have to let the cortex know to be aware of your position. Number four, what if you're not at equilibrium? What are you going to do? What if you're not at balance? Like this, you're going like this, and you're, going, you're, up, you're about to fall down. You're not allowed to fall down. What, what's your reaction of the body? You will contract the opposite muscle, right? And that's why when you walk, the balance is kept by flexi flexion of the right knee, extension of the left, right? Flexion of the left knee, extension of the right. How this coordination is happening is to keep your balance. How did you keep your balance? Vestibular nuclei. Did you get this? Yeah. Okay. The sensation of motion of the eye, when you move your eyes like this. I put something like this and I follow, follow, or you rotate, okay? or doing like this in front of you, you are sensing this motion, sensing the motion of the eye, and this will be detected by the superior colliculus of the mesencephalon. The mesencephalon is the other name of the midbrain, okay? So superior, do you remember the four colliculi? Corpora quadrigemina, 233, superior colliculi, inferior colliculi. The superior ones are the ones that get the eye movement, the motion, okay? If you, what if you're spinning? You see the point jumping? Like, look at this. If I'm trying to follow, I can follow it smoothly, right? If I move it like this, can you follow it or you see something jumping, right? So you cannot follow that much if it is spinning too hard. Nystagmus, of course, important. Look at this on my finger and don't move your eye. Stop your eye. Can't. You cannot. So if you are unable to focus, control your eye movement, then those are people who are always having their eyes like this. Even if he's looking at you, talking to you, he's supposed to be concentrating, his eyes are going like right, left, right, left, like this. This is spinning or this movement uncontrolled, and this is called nystagmus, and it always means there is something wrong. Where is it in the brain stem? Because the brain stem control the muscles that do this action. And the muscles, uh, the, 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 the brain stem is not inhibiting the muscle. The brain stem should control, should tell the muscles, you're looking right, 
contract the muscles that keep you looking right. Left, center. But if you don't have that control, it will be going like this. Brainstem. Or the inner ear. How is that? The inner ear will give you a false signal that you need to move right and left. Okay? Uh, the object is right, the object is left. So it's giving you a false signal and you're trying to follow the signal coming from a problem in the inner ear. Okay, now how you get the frequency of the sound? You get the frequency by which part of the cochlear duct is stimulated? Part. So the part gives you the frequency. The intensity, the number of the hair cells, right? Did you stimulate 50 hair cells or 500 hair cells or 200 hair cells? The number of hair cells, the more hair cells you stimulate, the higher the volume. So if I'm talking too loud to you, what's going to happen is you're moving a lot of these hair cells. If I'm whispering and you're hearing something that's very faint, the hair cells will be moving just a little bit of the hair cells, not all of them. So the louder the voice, the more recruiting of the hair cells, right? Um, frequency of the sound, how to know the frequency which which w by which you can tell apart uh, or understand what, what's being said to you, what are you hearing. It depends on which part is stimulated. Organ of corti, of course that's important for both of them. For lab and luxury, what are the components? Tectorial membrane, which is a free ending membrane from one side, the basilar membrane from the other side, and the hair cells in between. What do you call these together? Organ of corti. Don't forget this. Here is free membrane, and this is the basilar membrane, and the hair cells in between. This will give you the organ of corti. And what's the organ of corti? This is the hearing organ. The hearing organ. This what change the signal coming to it into an electrical signal. This is the hearing body. Uh, the pressure waves, which is making the sound, looks like an S-shaped. We call it the sine waves. And the wavelength is the distance between two adjacent waves. Frequency can be measured by hertz, which is the number of cycles per second. Uh, the, the, the pitch, on the other hand, is the response, our sensory response. Amplitude is the intensity of the sound waves. And we say the amplitude by decibels. So the amplitude is not measured the same as the frequency. Frequency is hertz. Amplitude, decibels. The hearing process itself is important to know the sequence. It's important for everything. You have to understand this. And I put a link after this uh, slide, the next slide. I'm not going to, to use it right now, but you, you, you have an access to it, and it's just explaining this process to you. So the sound waves will arise, go through the external acoustic canal, vibrate the tympanic membrane, moving M, moving I, moving S, mainly as ink escapes, entering to the oval window, moving the fluid inside, and the fluid inside will, be, will move this is the endolymph, and this is the perilymph. Somebody was asking, this is the inside, which is the endolymph, and the perilymph is outside. So you're going to move around, and, and you're moving the fluid, turbulence of the fluid inside. Here's a video, you can watch it anytime you want. So sound waves go to the tympanic membrane, tympanic membrane send it to the Amelius Incus Stapes. And you need to remember that as you pass through the three ossicles, you're amplifying, you're amplifying the sound. You're amplifying the signal. Why? Because you start with this part that attach tympanic membrane like this, right? And the malleus will start like point like this in the middle of the tympanic membrane. 
and it will move through small to large, small like the gears, the bike, small to large, and it will end at the oval window. So you start like point like this, amplify, small, amplify, until you get to the oval window. By the time you get to the oval window, you're amplifying. And if you ask yourself, why are we having three? Why don't we have one connection between the tympanic membrane and the oval window? That's it, isn't it easier? Why are we having three? Because as you pass through these three, you're amplifying the sound. So, so at the end, stapes will move at uh, the oval window, making pressure waves at the perilymph, distorting the basilar membrane against the, te the uh, tectorial membrane. And by doing this, you're going to move the hair cells, bending them. And this will create an electrical signal that will be moving from the hair cells. Neurotransmitters will be released, which is part of the organ of Corti. And this will go to the spiral ganglia, spiral ganglia, from the organ of Corti to the nerve fibers go to the spiral ganglia. The, the neurons will have to relay in the spinal ganglia. What's the spinal ganglia? This is a collection of the bodies of the neurons that bring the sensation or the signal from the hair cells. We said superior colliculus about the movement of the eye, right? Inferior colliculus for hearing. Can you remember this? Do you remember the two, the four? Superior colliculi, inferior colliculi. Remember this. Superior colliculi, eye movement. Inferior colliculi, hearing. Hearing range, we talked about this. Which one have greater range? Children or adults? Children. Children. And as you grow, the range decrease. The aging effect, everything deteriorates. Ossicles, stiff. Round window, ossify. Movement, decline. Concepts, I just added this today. We went through this already, okay? The concepts at the end of the three chapters is what I use, not, not all of them. I get some of this and some of this and some of that. I put them together and that will make our matching. The first part, I think it was like eight, ten questions, I think like ten questions or so. So these are the concepts. We went through it, so I'm not going to repeat it just to save the time. But did we go through this all? So I got it from all over so that you can uh, 